Welcome to today's lesson on strings. Very excited to talk about strings because there's so much we can do with them. And we're gonna start by going over the basics, how to print them to the console, how to format them so they look nice when we're printing for the user. We're gonna talk about slicing them up on an individual character level, going from one character to another and then taking pieces in between. We're gonna talk about concatenation, which is the process of putting strings together again, merging them. We're gonna talk about escaping, which are special characters that we can use to get out of strings and put in information that gives it much more power. We're going to talk about raw, which is another type. It's an input type that lets the user type things to us. And then we can change those using casting into numbers or floats or whatever we need to do with them. We're going to talk about Reaper, which is a function that doesn't print in the same way a human would read it, but it does in the same way that a computer thinks about what it's giving us. And it can be really useful in a lot of situations. Then we're going to talk about encoding. So we talked about everything being UTF-8 inside of Python. So we're going to look at all the different fun characters we have, how we can use them. And then we're going to use an ORD analysis to actually figure out what's going on behind each of the characters. And then finally, we're just going to show off a bunch of methods. I don't have enough time to go through everything, but we're going to look at how to change the cases and strip them in different ways and do alignments and finds and replaces and splits and oh my. Let's hop into the deep end of strings. So the basics. Okay, Python has a built-in class of strings. You'll know this as str when you search for the different types. And here's an example. A best friend is like a four-leaf clover. Hard to find, lucky to have. I'm going to put that string of text into a variable called friend. And now I'm going to make a couple more of those and look at the different types. OK, they're both strings. Makes sense, whether they have spaces or not. Now, here's a question for you. The number equals 5, but it's in quotes. Is it going to be a string or an integer? Well, we should know this. It's going to be a string, an str. And that is because of the quotes. Okay, now let's talk about the basics of printing. So, of course, we have double quotes, which we're starting to get used to for making a string variable. But also, don't forget, we have single quotes. And the reason you might want to use a single quote or a double quote in different situations has to do with the text inside. So, in this example, it's National Pi Day. We have a contraction that uses a comma. So, we're going to want to use maybe double quotes, but also maybe we have double quotes inside. So, we want to use single quotes or some kind of mixture of them. So later we'll look at some other ways to handle that, but just in a basic understanding, either of these, they're just identical. They're the same thing. So let's look at some formatting issues. Now, formatting becomes a big thing. You're constantly printing, you're constantly writing things out, and knowing how to make it all look right and spaced right and read right for the user is a big thing. So formatting is one of those kind of core concepts in programming. So let's make a couple variables here. We have one that's called pop and another one called tart. Of course, brother and sister, I assume. And there's an old style of printing. This does work in Python 3. It also works in Python 2. You'll see it a lot, but it's not the recommended way. So I just wanted you to see it, but not really use it. And that is to print out this percent %s, percent %s, and then use a percent in the middle, and it corresponds to the two variables. So when you run that, it does work, um, but it's not the preferred way. And there's a lot more powerful things you can do when you use this dot .format function, OK? So this is the way we should be printing things. Print, you open the quotes, and you close them. And somewhere in between where you want the variables to show up, you use these double brackets. Double bracket, double bracket, OK? So we know that var1 corresponds to pop and var2 with tart. So it should say, dang, comma, my pop was tarted. I know, I know. OK, so there we go. Boom, worked just fine. But here's some cool things we can do now also. We can also put the order of the variables in, in any order that we want in the brackets. So uh, this one will go first, then second by default. But look, now we can say make this the zeroth, because Python often uses zero for the number one slot. And then number one, meaning number two, for this one. So when we run this, you'll see we get a reversed order. Dang, my tart was popped, you know? Very cool. And in this one, we're doing the same thing, but now we're adding a duplicate, OK? So now we have 0 twice, which no problem. We can do that, too. So you can see how powerful it is to use this dot format with an open close parentheses, because they're 
um, variables that are being put in at, passed in as parameters. Okay, now let's look at some slicing. And, you know, it might not be an intuitive word, but what we mean is we're taking the sentence up. Imagine it like a carrot, and we're slicing it into little pieces. And each one of those pieces is the different characters, the K, the N, the O, the W. So we're going to make a new variable here called knowledge. And now let's talk about some of the functions we have. Like we have len, which comes up a lot, and it's actually going to count how many characters there are inside. So count them for me, and then take a guess at what this cell is going to return. 55? Whoa, that's a lot, but it's also correct. Now, here's a question. Does it use the space as a character or not? Holy crap, I don't know the answer to this. I just asked it and thought it up right now. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, 55, that includes the spaces, because spaces are going to be a Unicode character, too. So now we both know. But let's look at slicing. So we're going to take knowledge, and we're going to put this different type of bracket. Notice the square bracket that we're using, not the normal parameter parentheses, OK? This is a different thing. This is slicing. And when we say 7, what we're saying is go in 7 letters, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we are going to be returning a G, okay? Now, we can also do a slice that's a bigger chunk. So instead of like little thin carrot slices, this is just like cutting the carrot into thirds or something with larger width in between. So in this case, we're going from character number 7 to character number 20. So what do you think is going to happen when we run this cell? Okay, we get GE is only A, you know, and this is the slice from 7 to 20 through here. Now, what about if we use 0 and then comma and then negative 1? Whoa, what's a negative? Well, Dylan, we haven't even talked about a negative. Where does that go? Well, I kind of gave it away with my mouse, but take a guess, and you can see it's an E. So it looped around, okay? We have E because it's at the very end. And this is another really cool, powerful thing. Sometimes you have these long lists and you know, long sentences and things like that, and you're going to want to start from the other end, start from the bottom and work your way up instead of working your way down. Now, we also have in between first and last letters. So we can do 1 colon negative 1. And that's a little confusing because one's a looped around and one's on the front end. So what do you think we're going to get? Oh, everything in between minus those two on the side. So, you know, it kind of you know, went around and just took out the ends, right? It chopped the ends off the two sides. And then I want to also show you that we can use some of our membership conditionals that you're going to learn in the next section. But it's really cool to just ask, you know, is the letter E inside of the word knowledge? Because behind the scenes, they're kind of working like lists. So we can do that too. True, E is in knowledge. You can see it right there next to the L and behind the D. OK, now let's talk about concatenation. So one of the things that we want to do at certain points is take these slices and put them back together, right? Like two strings can be merged together. So here's a couple of variables I've created, popsicle, knuckleball, and then a sequence, which is all made of strings, three strings, Alvin, Simon, and Theodore with little dashes around them. So let's go ahead and make those variables. And then let's do this. It's a concatenation. Pop string plus knuckle string is equal to this new variable x. What do you think is going to happen when we print x? It squished them all together, right? Popsicle, knuckleball, right? Now, what if we do multiplication? What do you think we're going to get when we take something that's a string and we multiply it by 5? Five times. Easy. Cool, huh? It's just popsicle, 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 everywhere. Popsicle, popsicle. Now, what if we concatenate a sequence, okay? So we have our Alvin, Simon, Theodore sequence above. What if we use pop string, which has already got some kind of a variable in it, our, our text, and then we do dot join, we bring that method in, and we pass in an entire sequence. So this is kind of confusing, right? Like we actually have pop string, which is its own variable, and we're passing in this sequence. So what do you think we're going to get? Alvin, Popsicle, Simon, Popsicle, Theodore. Whoa, blow my mind. But there's some very cool things like join that we can use to put these together. And that's a process called concatenation. Now let's move on to our next topic, which is escaping. Basically saying that there are certain patterns that if you put them inside of a string can break out of the string. But most importantly, it's this one character that's used most often. It's a backslash, OK? So remember forward slash and backslash, this is the one that has the top leaning to the left. It's the leaning tower of Pisa falling to the left. And when you use this in between what should be just a normal string, it's going to break out the next character. And the next character in this case happens to be N. And N 
is going to create a new line when it's broken out. So in this sense, take a guess what you're going to see. Is that what you expected? It takes high. It adds the space. There's actually a space right here. That's a character that came in. And then it sees this and says, OK, the next character is going to make me do something different, not something that normally would be inside of a string. Oh, it's the letter N, create a new line, and then ho. So we have hi-ho, hi-ho. It's off to the next cell we go. And in this one, we're using the letter T. Now, T is short for a tab. And some of these things you're just going to have to memorize. But as long as you understand the concept of escaping and you're trying to do something with text, you can probably go look up some of the other characters that you can escape, and depending on your use case. But as long as you know they're there, you can do really cool things, like combine it with multiplication. So just like before, what do you think we're going to get when we multiply an escape character and then N with 5? Yeah, five new lines. Check down here. Line, 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 line. Now let's talk about raw input, which is something that is super cool. It's the ability to simply ask the user for information, text, numbers, integers, and then use it in the same way as we've been using everything else. So here's an example. If you wrap this string, what's your name, in a function that starts with input, what do you think is going to happen? Well, let's find out. What's your name? And then this cool text box. Look, I can name myself whatever I want. Bozo. OK, well, well, what happened now? Well, we have a variable here that we set this to. So let's check what's in it. Bozo. Cool, huh? So it just prompts the user to input things. And then if you're working with websites and things like that, you can actually style it so it happens in different ways. But at the core of it, this is Python's way for you to just type input. And one of the things we can do is actually cast before dropping it into our variable. So you can see how that could be sort of convenient. If we were to take an input and it was some kind of a number, we might want to cast it into a float because we'd want to do a calculation with it. I mean, I do my fingernails probably three times a month, but yeah, once a month. OK, so the number one goes in. And because of the dot zero, we already know that it's a float. Couldn't have done that in any other way, but I suppose just to show you how the proper way to do it is, because you don't always have that hint, would be to wrap it up like that. And you'd see that it's a float. OK, cool. So what if we want to take how many times each month do you cut your fingernails and turn that one into a float? And then we want to use some concatenation. Maybe we want to add them. Actually, so this is a, actually, that's an interesting mistake I just made. We could probably learn from that. Plus, we'll concatenate it if these two are both strings. but we have changed them both into floats. So the plus is just going to do what plus does always in math and add the two together. OK, so next question is, how many times each month do you cut your fingernails? Well, I cut them three times on average, precisely. So we run that. Now we can actually add the two together and put them in a new variable. And we can have the total of four times a month on average. I'm cutting either some kind of my nails guess is the way to interpret that. <laughs> now let's talk about this Reaper function, because I find that it's a great way to see how we interact with computers versus how a computer acts with the computers. Okay, it's like catching it in its own little environment. How do you talk to yourself when I'm not around, you know? But if we import this module date time, which you don't need to know, we can make a couple of these variables based on date and time. So. Let's just print these out no, using a normal print. So what we're saying is take the information that came, turn it into a string, cast it, and then print it out. So you can see the format, the 2016, 1204, and then the hour, minute, second, and like super decimal second. OK, now I want to take the same variables, but now instead of printing them out with string, let's print them out with the Reaper function and see the difference. Now in this case, it looks quite a bit different. It, look, it says, date time dot date, which is similar to how it's up here, date time dot date, and then dot today, this function, this method right here is now replaced. And just to remind you guys, it is a function, but it's also a method because we're accessing it through the dot syntax. But you can see it's a little bit different. This is more of how the computer sees it and views it and thinks about where the information came from. And this is more about how humans would want to read it. So sometimes it can be great to run different things that you're trying to learn about through the Reaper function just to see kind of a more structured way of where they're coming from. Now let's talk about encodings. I want to build on that UTF-8 statement we made in the new mnemonics. So 
ASCII is a different set of characters. This is the one that you could have found in some places in Python 2 or Python 1, and what you'd find in older computers that's now been totally removed from Python 3. But it's the characters that kind of I'm most familiar with. They come on the American keyboard. But look at this. If we actually make a variable and we put a string in it with ASCII characters, in Python 2 we could have asked, is this instance um, Unicode. Like we could have said, is it ASCII or is it Unicode? We could have checked for it, but it's, we're going to get a warning now because everything is Unicode. And that threw me off because it's saying like Unicode's not defined, but it's just because it's baked so deeply into Python 3 that we don't need to check it all the time. And that means we can just write variables like this, strings that have whatever that is, the, the umla, I think, or umla or something, and then, you know, cool Japanese characters like that, they can just be written right in. And one of the cool things about this is that with Python 3, we can actually just use Unicode. We can use Greek letters that come with Unicode, so we can use the pi symbol if we want to just set math.py to, you know, the pi. We can use um, the Greek letter epsilon, the capital one, if we want to use something for, like, sum. And it makes it very cool. We can use all these, like, copyright icons and things like that inside of our code to, you know, explain things better to other people who are reading it and to remind ourselves and, you know, just be badass programmers, really. Okay, and then I want to talk to you about this function. It's called ORD. And what it's doing is it's linking a specific Unicode number that we don't see but is actually behind every character. So in an ASCII character like A, there's going to be a specific number in Unicode UTF-8 that is going to correspond to the capital letter A. So we'll have another one for the capital B, and you can see that they're separate, but then when you actually go to lowercase, they have their own numbers too. So this is how it's keeping track behind the scenes of all these characters. In fact, I think I could probably even take like this Greek epsilon and throw it in there, and then it's gonna have its own number, and it's always gonna be that same number. So that's gonna correspond with what we see on our end. Okay, so just one other use case for this I want to show you is that we can use a for loop, and I know you haven't seen this before, we'll talk about it later, but just kind of observe it and get familiar with it on a sort of superficial level, to actually run through every single character in a string and show us what the character is that corresponds to the UTF-8. So, you know, that capital I is always going to be the number 73 behind the scenes. Okay, now let's talk about some methods that we can use with strings, because this is really where the fun stuff is. Okay, so finally let's talk methods, and there's way too many to cover everything, but I just want to get you excited about some of the big groupings and the stuff that I use a lot. So let's start with a new variable that's a long string, our best friend string, and now we can actually use the method dot capitalize to make sure it starts with a capital. In this case it already does, so you don't see anything, but that A at the beginning right there is because we ran it through this method. And we can go further and use some other cool ones like upper, uh, we can make everything lowercase, we can make everything title case so that each letter has a capital at the beginning of it. And we even can do checks. So you can take a string variable and you can say dot is upper and we're asking give me a true or false response if it is all upper or if it's not. And you can do that to then trigger the change. So you can say, hey, bring me a bunch of text. If it's not already in title case, then make it in title case or something along those lines. There's also some really cool ones that we can use with strip. And this is going to remove white spaces. So if we have an input function, like a raw function that we looked at before, and somebody types in some stuff with a bunch of spaces at the beginning or end, this is going to strip those clean. We also can remove the leading white spaces or just the trailing white spaces. Kind of hard to see these, but they would be spaces that would be over here, over here. We can also do some cool stuff with alignment. Um, for example, this one dot center is going to bring us a method that allows us to put 50 characters before and after. It'll take that number and split it between the two and put them on both sides to help center your text. And there's some other cool alignment ones too we don't have time for, but I want to get to find. So if we take this string here and we use dot find clover, it's actually going to parse through the entire thing and find the word clover. And then it's going to count how many spaces it went before finding it. So we know that it's 34 in. Um, there's also this one that counts characters. We're looking for how many times the letter A in lowercase shows up. So like one, two, three, four, like that. It will count it and return that there's four in the entire string. And the max and min, which you might think of usually only in the terms of numbers, are also in alphabetical order. So it can say, you know, is there a Q? Is there a Z? What's the maximum height letter inside of this string? And we can see that it's a Y, and we can do the same with min. I'm sure it'll find an A. Oh, actually a nothing. Yep, so even before A is a space. So 
It's really cool. There's a lot of neat things you can do with find and replace. You can actually go in and say, take the word clover, right? Which this can be a really useful function. And we know where that is right here. And then we say, replace it with snickerdoodle. Then boom, a best friend is like a four leaf snickerdoodle. That is very cool. And it can do some of the same things that you can do a slice, but way simpler, more automated, especially with big corpuses of text. So let's make our friend variable, and then let's just run dot split method and see what happens. Whoa, how cool is that? It broke out our entire sentence into individual words. And it does this by any delimiter we want. So we didn't put in an argument. We passed in nothing. So it just did a default, which is to look for these spaces. But check this out. We can also add in the string with a comma in between it, and it's going to look for these and split at the commas. So see, now we have a list that has three different items in it, and it's the ones between the commas. And we can do that with all sorts of stuff. You can make maybe LE is where you want on yours to be, or I don't know, some kind of crazy array that makes sense to you. And the last one I want to talk about is split lines. This is just like split, but what it's going to do is automatically do it on the character return. So if you had a large corpus of text that had paragraphs, this would break it in each paragraph into their own item on a list. Very cool stuff, lots of neat methods. I encourage you to explore. Oh, and remember, what about this? Uh, in fact, before we end, I will give you a reminder of something else we learned. Dot tab is going to let you look through all of these cool things. So I encourage you now to just go through and play with them all, see what else you can do with the text. Subscribe to the Mnemonic Academy YouTube channel for daily uploads that will help you learn amazing concepts through effortless associations.